This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Jeff Doolittle. In this episode, I will be discussing decoupled content management systems with Bob Kepford. Bob is a lead architect at MediaCurrent, a single source digital agency for development, design, strategy, and training. He specializes in content management systems and web presence for major corporations, governments, and nonprofits. Bob is a frequent speaker at Drupal conferences and related events. He is the creator of the Weekly Drop, an email list that reaches over 12,000 developers in the Drupal community every week. Bob is a co-organizer of the annual Decoupled Days Conference in New York and has been at the forefront of a movement toward adoption of decoupled content management systems, which is our topic for this episode. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio, Bob. Thanks, Jeff. It's uh, really good to be a guest. Yeah, glad you could be here to join me today. So let's get started. Can you briefly define content management systems for me before we begin a deeper discussion of what decoupled content management systems entail? Yeah, content management systems have been around much longer than I've been working in this industry. And today, when you think of a content management system, most people think of uh, things like Sitecore or Drupal or WordPress. Uh, And these systems are basically software systems that allow a team to manage the content for their organization. That could be their blog, that could be their mobile apps, could be a whole network of websites that consume content from the content management system. They usually also handle media, so give the editors a way to create images and upload videos and have those those all kind of blended together into the content we get when we go onto the web or when we open apps. Uh, so they're, there's a lot of things and a lot of different ways that they are used, but that's kind of the summary of what they are. Okay. So explain to me a little bit about the trade-offs with any decision. There's always going to be pros and cons or, or costs and benefits. So are there any specific challenges involved in adopting a CMS and how does that relate to the, the trade-offs of adopting a content management system? Yeah. So there's a lot of trade-offs and to, Depending on your needs, uh, you might choose a different system versus another one. One of the big differentiators, I think, is the size of the organization and the amount of uh, administrators and editors you need. If you're just starting up a blog and and you just have one or two people, you know, WordPress probably is the most popular content management system on the internet as far as that goes, just sheer numbers. But the the vast majority of those sites are, are blogs. Uh, a lot of them, you know, single editor blogs. When you get into more uh, advanced requirements where you need to tag content and you need to have revisioning and kind of complex workflows, although WordPress can do those types of things, a lot of people will lean towards more towards something like Drupal. And and I work mostly in the, well, 100% in the open source world. So I don't really deal with the proprietary systems that are out there like from Adobe and, and other uh, companies, but Uh, That's another big differentiator. A lot of people uh, have their options open, so they like going with open source because you're not locked into one vendor or their their product lifecycle. You can customize and and add on your own functionality, and both Drupal and WordPress give you a lot of uh, options there. Okay. Options are kind of endless when it comes to that stuff, but these different systems have different strengths and weaknesses. So Absolutely. So to kind of summarize what you said there, It sounds like the more complex your requirements are or the more collaboration that there is going on, the content management systems are meant to kind of address those needs. Yes. Yeah. And and then you have multiple channel content aggregation, that type, those types of things. If if you have needs there, uh, content management system is usually a good idea. It sounds like we could deep dive into that, but (laughs) we're going to run out of time getting to decoupled content management systems. Yeah. So maybe let's switch gears there now that we've sort of laid a basic foundation of what content management systems are all about and what they're good for. So we're going to talk about decoupled content management systems. But first, should software engineers be interested in content management systems? 
I sometimes wonder if people have the impression maybe those are for designers rather than engineers or architects. So in, in other words, why should we care? Yeah, it, it's a good question to ask because I, I, I really do run up against that when I'm in kind of the developer world outside of my own typical circles uh, when I get around software architects that don't work in WordPress or Drupal or in content management systems at all. Yeah, there's, there's this kind of idea that like, well, it's just a utility uh, kind of a solved problem maybe, or not an interesting problem. I definitely think there's a big place for uh, engineers and software architects in the CMS world. And there's a lot of them that work in this world. It may not be what's getting a lot of the press or the attention, but it's definitely a use case there. Th there's a lot of complexity around delivering uh, a good experience to end users, but that is more of a front end developer problem. But there's a lot of a lot of work to be done around the whole editorial experience and APIs and how things interact with each other. So there's some interesting problems to solve with the, with content management systems for sure. I see. So how else is the space growing in complexity? You mentioned the front end, but I imagine cloud technologies, cloud native solutions, things of that nature might be expanding the complexity that it takes in order to deploy and leverage a content management system. Yeah, I mean, you have so content delivery networks, CDNs are just kind of an expectation these days. So WordPress, Drupal, all these CMSs pretty much support that, uh, integrating with these cloud services. So you'll, what you're seeing is a lot of these uh, traditional CMSs are adapting to meet the needs of the market and where, where those problems are better solved outside of the content management system. A lot of people use those solutions. Uh, I mean, Drupal has been around for a long time, as, as WordPress has, and a lot of these things didn't exist when they were originally created. So there's another aspect to it that both of these CMSs specifically, and I'm going to talk a lot about those two because I know them the best, but, you know, you've got, they were created in a different time than we're in now. So there is a lot of uh, thought process going in, like how do, how do we, what would we do if we built a CMS, you know, from scratch today, and how would that be different? And then trying to move these systems to be more like, like that, uh, that approach. Okay. So let's transition now to talking about decoupled content management systems specifically. So how do they differ from more the standard coupled approach that we've had historically? Yeah. So a, a, a typical CMS like WordPress or Drupal, we, we refer to them now as monolithic applications. So they do everything from the content editing experience to actually writing out the HTML and CSS that is delivered to a user. And a decoupled system differs from that in that there are different types of ways, ways that you can decouple the systems, but basically what you're doing is splitting apart the content management from the actual website. So instead of, instead of WordPress or Drupal rendering HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that a person actually looks at in their browser, what you're actually giving uh, or putting outputting from the content management system is an API. And then you build uh, whatever website you want. So you could build it in React or Angular. Um, you could write it in Ruby, whatever system you want to just build your website and you interact with an API to get your content content into the website. And that's, that's the main difference. I see. So, so in a standard monolithic system, you might call that more of a turnkey approach. Whereas it sounds like with a decoupled content management system, you're going to be putting the pieces together and making decisions of your own instead of having those decisions being pre-made for you. Exactly. Yeah. Like with Drupal and, and WordPress, you, you have to learn how to build a theme in WordPress or Drupal, and that is going to be written in PHP. You know, there are templating, you know, languages and things like that, that you have to learn. So it does, it does make those choices for you. It's way more opinionated. Okay. So is there a general industry shift in this direction or maybe is it momentum just in certain pockets? And if so, kind of what's driving this, this movement? There's definitely uh, an industry-wide shift. And there are many drivers. I would say one of them is just speed to market. And the, the second one, I think, is this, the availability of people to actually do the front-end development. Uh, the front-end development world has rapidly um, adopted JavaScript as a language and many different tool. The tooling around JavaScript has just exploded in popularity and diversity. So there's all kinds of stuff there. So it's not, it's not difficult to find a good JavaScript developer these days that can do front end development. It's much more difficult to find uh, a really experienced Drupal 
front end developer that knows Twig, which is the templating engine that Drupal uses. Um, and so the WordPress, I think it's a little bit, they have a simpler system, but it's still, you know, I, I don't really know a lot of WordPress developers that love, that would prefer writing their template in PHP. They, they prefer JavaScript. I see. So the shifts in front end technologies are one of the drivers. And it sounds like maybe there's some other ones from the back end as well. Talk a little bit about what the nature is of decoupling the back end system. So versus separating content entry from content delivery, I imagine there's a lot more to the architecture behind it than just that separation. Yeah, there, there is. And especially, you know, if you look at an existing or a legacy system like WordPress or Drupal versus something, some of the newer systems that are being, that are coming out or hosted solutions even more so. They're a, the newer things are API driven. So that's, that's their singular focus to start with. And tools like WordPress and Drupal, that is where they're moving. They're developing uh, API first initiatives where they're really focusing on the API level and even internally decoupling the systems that, that, you know, work with each other within the software project. So a lot of the reasoning behind that is that these systems have developed over years and their complexity has gotten very high. So it is, it's more and more difficult to jump into WordPress or Drupal into the core system and understand what's happening. And so there's a desire to kind of break out those systems where they can be used interchangeably and it makes it easier to maintain the project as a whole. And, I, and I'm talking about actually the core project, not, not what somebody that's just using it would do, but just for the long-term health of the project, it needs to happen. Interesting. Uh, so that's an, yeah, that's another aspect. So even with the standard monolithic coupled s content management systems, it sounds like they're moving to a decoupled approach as well as they are able to. Yeah. I, I think the impact of, you know, Martin Fowler's talks and blog posts from years and years ago about microservices have, they still are still having impact across, you know, these older systems that predated the microservices kind of revolution. It can be taken to an extreme that's too far and doesn't make sense away from monoliths, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned, you know, that we've learned over the years from software development that if you break, if you have something really, really complex, it's hard to get your head around. It's really hard to maintain. So it, it makes sense to break things into services and, and do that type of an approach. So you mentioned that one of the risks is you can over decouple. So that would definitely be a potential wrong decision. So what factors do you use to sort of help you make that determination of how much coupling is too much versus how much decoupling is too much? Yeah, the way the way I like to look at it when I come into a project for a client and, and I'm just, you know, at a discovery on a project is just to look at what are the problems they're trying to solve here and in a lot of cases it makes the most sense just to use just the standard Drupal install or standard WordPress install uh, because they don't need to decouple their content from their content management. They don't need, they don't have apps. They don't, they don't need an API. So you're adding a bunch of complexity, you know, for no real gain. I see. But you know, there are other situations where, you know, they may not have a lot of apps or API needs, but they do have front end developers and those developers, best, they know JavaScript and they, and they, let's say they want to, they know React and they want to do redesigns pretty much every year. We don't want them to have to learn Drupal just for the content management part of it because they, they can have a pretty simple Drupal site and it's very low maintenance or a simple WordPress site. And they can focus on new versions of their website using the tools they like. And, you know, the word, the, the, the content management can be kind of boring. It can just be a, you know, a service that they use. Okay. So let's talk about, I mentioned before that it seems that monolithic content management systems could be considered more turnkey, but are there any such things as turnkey decoupled content management systems, or is someone required to put their entire system together themselves? There are some, it's, I, I hesitate to call them turnkey because you, on almost all of them, or all maybe just say all of them, you have to set up your content model. So your content types, the fields, permissions, things like that that you need. But there are some solutions in both uh, open source and closed source for that. There, like Drupal has a distribution which is kind of like a custom version of Drupal called Contenta, and you can download and install that. And it basically has 
pretty much everything you'd want installed and enabled and configured in good defaults. And then you can go in and set up your content types. And then there are closed source services that you can just pay for. One of them is uh, Netlify CMS. There's another one called Sanity. There's Contentful. And these are all kind of API based content management systems. You know, you can go get started in minutes and you're not hosting anything. You're just paying for a month, either paying monthly or paying based, based on what you use. So you don't have to go out there and build your CMS. You can, there's, there's all kinds of different levels of effort you could have on the scale. I see. Interesting. So what challenges have you faced as you've been communicating the need for decoupled content management systems in certain situations? I think one of the challenges is communicating this to a non-technical audience. What, what does the editorial experience look like? How does it change? And even when you try to explain it, people seem like they're getting it, but they're, they're not really getting it until they see it. So I think having demos and things like that, where you're like, here's, you know, you're editing in one browser window and your website's in a different one. They're at different URLs. And just when you make a change and click save, it may not show up immediately on the actual website, depending on your configuration. You know, the WYSIWYG kind of problem that has been around for years where what you see is what you get is what that stands for, for those that don't live in this world. <laughs> and those that, I mean, I've, I've spent a good part of my career just dealing with the hell that is WYSIWYGs. They've never actually accurate. Yeah. So th that's one challenge. Another one is just you, you're basically taking out a bunch of complexity that existed in a system and, ex and breaking that into different services. So if somebody doesn't know that that complexity is there, cause it's been buried away from them inside of a monolith, it can seem like that you're adding complexity, but what you're actually doing is making, you know, those complex items, breaking them into simpler systems where somebody on your team can be an expert in them and focus on them. So th just explaining that stuff, it, there's just a lot of complexity in how these systems work together. And a lot of folks that are not engineers are not familiar with what's actually happening. There's a lot of magic basically. Right. So what would an end user experience distinctly with a well decoupled content management system versus a coupled one before you mentioned, for example, you might enter your content and then you have another browser window open to a different URL in order to review the published content. You also mentioned something about a delay, which we could have a whole side conversation <laughs> about eventual consistency, but let's avoid that for now. <laughs> but, but the way you described it, it almost sounded like a drawback to the end user. So what's the positive benefit for me, maybe as a non-technical end user of a decoupled content management system where I would say, oh, I understand. Here's what I'm gaining by going that route. Yeah, it, it is definitely a trade-off. And I will say that I'm describing it today, kind of the experience I see that there's a slight delay or maybe a few minute delay. And that, that is a problem the industry is going after and figuring out ways to, uh, to avoid to where it's almost instantaneous. But the trade-off there is that you get this multiple channel content API that you can write once and publish everywhere. That and that's been the case. That's nothing really new. I mean, before we had this fancy term decoupled, people like the like NPR had content management system that they use, and they were they were writing up uh, stories and then publishing them to Twitter and publishing them to their blog, publishing them to their podcast, all at the same time. Uh, so that that really is like the big win is that you can get all that content out, and the editor only has to write it once. Interesting. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about the challenges that you've faced when you've tried to implement decoupled, well, I shouldn't say tried, but when you have successfully as well implemented decoupled content management systems on any particular projects you've worked on. Yeah. One of the challenges I think that is the biggest one in my mind right now is the kind of editor experience and basically preparing people for the difference with what they're used to of it being two separate systems, the website and then the content management system and getting them to where they understand the benefits uh, versus just the drawbacks. And that, that's kind of a challenge as far as on the personal and the, the training level. But on the technical level, one of the challenges, biggest challenges I've seen is that service or um, projects like WordPress and Drupal allow you to do a whole lot of things. And some of those things they don't do extremely well. I would say like Drupal, one of Drupal's bigger weaknesses is probably that it's not the greatest system for building landing pages. And when I say landing pages, that's kind of a marketing term, but basically layout management and that kind of thing. So 
w how you want the page to be laid out and then adding in a bunch of widgets and things like that. Uh, there, there's been ways to do that with Drupal for years. It's a tough problem to solve actually, to make it both performant, easy to use and you know, low bug, and, you know, so you don't have a lot of bugs in your page. And that in a decoupled approach is very complicated to do. It's a lot easier to do in a traditional Drupal or WordPress site. So there are services, like I always like to look at complex problems is there are there startups that totally focus on this one problem and there are landing page builder startups that are very successful because that's all they focus on is building a landing page right i think that's one of the more weak spots in the decoupled architecture is is landing page building i mentioned some other ones but that that those are those are two really big ones right now a lot of the other ones have kind of over the past year and a half or two become kind of solved problems so maybe describe to me briefly, and I know it's difficult without pictures, but what are the main elements that somebody would have in their decoupled architecture with this approach? And maybe name some of the tools that you've used or that you have exposure to that sort of fill some of those various roles within this decoupled system. Yeah, for sure. So I've already mentioned Drupal and WordPress, so that's content management. There are other tools that, that I've used a lot, one of them being GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language. It's basically just a standard, and there are plenty of projects that implement that standard. Uh, so things like Apollo, and there are many other uh, projects. So basically what that tool does is we'll take in API endpoints from different sources and provide them as a singular API for your team to use. So you can write queries that are very expressive uh, of what you need and only get back the data that you've requested. Uh, so that, that could be a whole show on GraphQL. It's a great tool, um, but that's heavily in the, in use in the JavaScript world and it definitely in the decouple world. So I've been able to build APIs with GraphQL that would allow our front end developer team to just have one API they deal with for all their content and they write queries and they only get back the data that they're requesting. So, you know, I'm sure your listeners are all familiar with REST and that kind of approach. GraphQL is a very different approach, whereas with REST endpoints, you make a request and you get back the whole object, even if you only need a couple of properties on the object. Whereas with GraphQL, you can specify that in your query. I just want the title and the slug or the URL, and that's all I want, and that's all you'll get. Right. And so that's that's one of the tools. You don't have to use that, but then we also have things for authentication. So we've used... AWS has auth all the all the cloud providers have different uh, authentication tools. Uh, things like uh, Auth0 and Okta are two big names in that world. So your WordPress typically would handle user management, but you can totally decouple that from Drupal or WordPress and use a service. Another one is uh, search. So your search index. So you could use Apache Solar or Elasticsearch. I mean, there's literally a limitless number of things that you can uh, bring into a, a decoupled architecture. So there's more I'm sure I could get into, but yeah, those are like the big ones that, that we use over and over again. Okay. So those are some of the, those almost sound like approaches, but maybe name the tool. Like for, for example, Gatsby JS is one that I'm mildly familiar with. And my understanding is you have some experience with that. So yeah. sort of what spaces is, is a tool like that filling and what isn't it providing for you that you have to add now to it when you want to deploy a system like this? Yeah. And the, so Gatsby is a great example in the architecture I kind of described there where you have Drupal or WordPress as a CMS and you've got all these other services doing things that you might need. Gatsby was is actually your website. So it's originally was billed as a static site generator. Uh, so you would just it would just actually build static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript out, and then you could host that on any server you know you want to. You could put it on GitHub, or you could put it on a host. Uh, you could store it on your Raspberry Pi. That that basically builds your website. And Gatsby is a really popular tool that we use a lot, written in React, and so it it essentially gives you a website and on top of that you get a react application so your website is statically rendered when somebody comes to the website the html is already rendered but also you're loading up a react application so you can do build time things that's all your static stuff but you also have the runtime of react so as soon as the browser hits that page your react ap application comes into play and you can make queries you can dynamically change things depending on who the user is and things like that. I see. So it sounds like there you're trying to get the best of both worlds between static site generation 
and runtime dynamic behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Gatsby is just one of the, pro- there, there's a lot of competitors. There's other tools that people use with decoupled that are written in other languages. And but Gatsby is what I'm most familiar with. Okay. So tell us a little bit about how you manage a decoupled content management system. So to start with, what does it look like to test the system like this? That's a really good question. In some ways, it's simpler than a, a monolithic approach. And in some ways, it's more complicated because you have more discrete tools and, and code to deploy. So you have, in a way, more things that you're aware of that you need to test. So starting with the CMS part, we, we start with a, a design spec, like here's the for the API. Here's what we need. Here's the fields that we need represented. You know, Drupal is a really good tool for building that because um, there's a... Uh, module built into Drupal core now called JSON API. And it's based on the JSON API spec. You can go look that up in your own time, but it's, it's basically a rest based, uh, specification for, for content. And so you, you define all what you want it to look like and you turn on some modules and then you can send it through your QA department. Uh, you can generate some demo content and make sure that you're getting back what you're requesting when you make uh, HTTP requests. And then for all the other API services, it's very similar. Um, you can write tests, you can run it through your QA, like here's what we expect from this input, we expect this output. So there's more of a like surface area to test, but the tests to me are, are simpler. Whereas with the traditional Drupal site, you're gonna be doing a lot more um, testing that is more developer specific, like unit testing type things, which you can do with, with all these approaches, but, um, it's just a little bit more discreet when it's its own service. Okay. Or you'll be doing more manual testing or automating it with something like Selenium versus testing directly against API endpoints. Yeah, exactly. Those Selenium was the name I couldn't remember. Okay. So how about deployment? What does that look like and how important is it to be able to deploy individual different components and version them independently of one another? Because otherwise you could get into a situation, <laughs> couldn't you, where you just have a distributed monolith? Exactly. Yeah, this is this is one of the things that's a little tricky when you first start doing it is figuring out deployment. How do we want to handle this? Uh, in practice, it hasn't been that difficult because when I first started doing this, I was thinking we should have more of the services in the same code repository. What I was trying to avoid was the having all these different repos that we have to manage and these deployment scripts and versioning. Uh, but what turned out, it turned out to be more of a hassle than it was worth. So we broke out most of the services into discrete Git repos, and then we can handle, you know, deployment with Jenkins and, and different tooling uh, individually. But it it is more complicated. Deployment, I think, is, is more complicated with the decoupled approach because you have to know where the dependencies are, where the arrows are pointing, and... It, it does does require more communication, I think, just to make sure you're not breaking anything. On the other hand, I have been able to see on projects that because we're decoupled, our front-end team has a lot more confidence in deploying code changes to production during peak hours um, because there's just a lot lower risk uh, because it's easier to roll back than a traditional CMS because usually it's static HTML and the APIs don't change that often because we, you know, done it right. And we've defined our spec ahead of time. I see it, in, in some ways it's, it's more complicated, but I think it's more resilient. You can change one thing in a system and not affect others. Uh, but you now when you get into API level, then you have to be a lot more careful about what your changes and make sure they don't af- cascade down the, the line of the dependencies. So what I heard there is you've made it easier for developers, especially front-end developers, to feel confident about making changes rapidly so they can respond very quickly if there's a requested change. But it sounds like you also spend a significant amount of time making sure that your API endpoints are more stable and less subject to change. And it's that foundation of stability that gives the front-end developers that ability to respond to change more quickly. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. And in practice, I think it's shown it to be true. And it, it it's another advantage of this approach is that a reason, one reason I will recommend decoupled sometimes is if the team really wants to iterate rapidly, you know, post launch, say we're building a new site and they, they don't want to be tied to the release cycle of WordPress or Drupal. They want to be decoupled in, in their, in their design so that they can make, they can spin out new versions to the site without having to touch their content management system. 
and anybody who's worked in the Drupal world for a long time will know the pain of updating from say Drupal six to seven. And, and Drupal as a project has gotten a lot better about major release changes to where now it's kind of a rolling release uh, system. It, it does give you a lot more options and more speed to market. I see. So you've mentioned Drupal a few times in our conversation, and I want to come back to that in a minute. But one more thing before we do, can you speak a little bit to the different security related challenges that you might have working with a decoupled content management system versus the standard system? Yeah, definitely. That is a, another big bonus of using decoupled on the positive side. It, it doesn't mean there's not risks with doing decoupled on the security side. There definitely are, but I really have to highlight these advantages. Uh, when you have a system like a WordPress or Drupal, they've been around for a long time, and, and I think both of the systems are really secure. However, you are setting up a system that's written in a scripting language that is, is accessible to the world. So you have to watch out for your inputs. So if you have comments or if you have authenticated users and they're able to create content or anything like that, you open yourself into a SQL injection attacks. So that's with a traditional CMS. I mean, all of, all of them have this problem because you have a database that's connected to the internet. So that, that is a problem that you do not have in a decoupled system because in a lot of the systems, you're just going to have a statically generated HTML, JavaScript, and CSS uh, code. And there's really nothing that can be done to compromise that site unless the server that it's running on is compromised. But there's no real way to do that. So you kind of get a bunch of security bonuses, like the things that are surface area of security risks just taken off the table. Uh, because you, you just don't have those vulnerabilities. Now that said, <laughs> yeah, most websites are not 100% static. So let's say you have to have user sign up or something like that. Then you're going to have to have a form. So your form is going to have to post to some API. And most APIs are not open to the world. So you're going to have to have API keys. And you don't want those just passed clear in the clear through the browser. So right. there's all kinds of challenges there. Um, most of them are solved by having a good API that, that uses keys that, uh, that rotate or, you know, there's multiple, you know, using uh, cross origin requests, making sure you're doing that right. So you're not just allowing requests to come sure. from any website in the world. So there's a, there's a whole list of things, but on the whole, I think the decouple approach is actually more secure than say the traditional CMS. Now, a question on that though, it sounds like you're saying that when you're doing decoupled content management, that inherently you're going to do static site generation and before you speak to that, what I'm what I'm hearing is you're basically reducing your threat vector when you go with static site generation because you have to explicitly opt in to, say, a form being able to be submitted or something of that nature versus with standard content management systems, every page request is rendered at request time yeah. and leaving you liable to attack. Yeah. So, so the attack vector limitation makes sense, but speak a little bit to whether or not static site generation is an inherent and necessary part of decoupled content management systems, or if that's maybe just something you would say is a best practice. Yeah. Thank you for calling that out because I think it's just extremely common and popular now for there to be static site connected with decoupled, but those are independent things. Um, there are plenty of decoupled projects that are not statically generated and there are plenty of uh, statically generated sites that aren't decoupled. So <laughs> right. yeah, that's a fair point. And yeah, it's complicated. Like there, there's so many different combinations of these things that you can do. And decoupling is a very broad term. And a lot of times that we focus on like the headless type of niche of that, which is, you know, you have a CMS that doesn't actually render HTML. And then you have a statically generated site that pulls data from an API. And that's just one, one type of decoupled project. I see. But I'm glad you mentioned headless content management systems, because I think that's something that might have already been in listeners' minds up to this point. Yeah. You've mentioned Drupal a few times, more than a few times. And I know you have a lot of experience with Drupal, and I'm sure you'll be sharing us uh, with us toward the end of the podcast a little bit about that. But tell me, what do you see the future for tools and platforms like Drupal in a decoupled world? Is there a place for them in projects that you're looking to build in the near future? Or do you see them kind of staying in the space they're in, but not expanding to move more into the decoupled space? That's a, that's a big question, but it's one I've thought a lot about. So Drupal specifically, I, I can't speak to WordPress as much, 
but there has been a lot of uh, mind share and resources thrown at making sure Drupal is moving in the right direction, the direction that the industry is going. Uh, only time will tell if it, that'll be successful, if it's uh, you know too late. I don't think Drupal is going away. I'm not trying to say that. I, I just I don't have a crystal ball. I think the Drupal community is doing the right things. Um, They're focusing on getting their APIs improved and being able to be the best open source uh, API driven content management system while not compromising on like the old approach of just, you know, out of the box, you can build whatever you want. So I think that's kind of the trajectory of, uh, of the Drupal project. And, you know, I, I still think Drupal is a really good choice for most of the projects I ever see. And that that's probably because of the company I work at, but we, it's very well adopted in higher education in large companies, large organizations have complex needs because of the richness of the ecosystem around it. There's so many contributed projects that you can piece together kind of like Lego blocks and build whatever you need. So that that's like the real big plus in the way of Drupal on top of, on top of the security team that, that Drupal has that stays on top of security vulnerabilities. And it's a, just a very well developed team of open source developers that work together to make sure that this is a good system. So maybe summarize for me again, if I'm evaluating a content management system approach for my company, what are the factors that would help me decide? You've mentioned a few, but maybe just summarize them here for us. What are some factors that would help you decide? I really need to go with a decoupled approach, or I really need to go with a static approach, or maybe I could choose either, but I know what the pros and cons are of each. So what factors do I absolutely want to make sure that I'm evaluating when I'm making a decision like this? Yeah, this is, um, this is a question I get asked a lot. So, and I'm always evaluating my answer. So let me know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think a big factor is content distribution, single channel or multi-channel. Um, and what I mean by that is like, do you just have a website or do you have a website, an app publishing to Twitter, Instagram, Facebook? And is that a problem for you? Would you like it to be a single system that manages all that, or at least that option? Another factor I think is your team buildup. Who's on your team? Are you supporting this internally? If so, what are the tools that they are comfortable with using? If they already are very comfortable with uh, front end development tools and you want to be able to really quickly iterate on your design, maybe it makes sense to go a decoupled route, whether that's Drupal or not is a separate question, but I think that's one of the things we look at a lot. Okay. So we were talking about the, the various factors. I th I'm curious about performance, but I think you already spoke to that one because static site gen is not equated with decoupled content management systems. You can have a monolith that, that does static site gen, but are there any other performance or end user related factors that might be something you want to consider with whether you're going to go coupled versus decoupled? Yeah, decouple approaches just you, you said it early on, it gives you more choices for the system. So you're not tied into, let's say, PHP for uh, your template system, or you're not tied into server side rendered uh, PHP, HTML. You, you have way more options. You could write a front end in Python, or you could write it in, in Angular or React. And maybe maybe you have a bunch of people that just came on your team that all know React really well, uh, and you none of them have ever used Python or PHP and you wanna move away. So if your systems are decoupled, you just have a lot more options there because you can you can change your front end without having to change your back end. Right. But of course, too many options can be a bad thing too. Yes, that is very true. Like, so if a site's really simple, like I said early on, with, like you got a simple blog and you want to get it up this weekend, you know, I wouldn't recommend unless you're a developer and we like to do these type of things over the weekend. Uh, <laughs> You know, probably you want to go with WordPress or maybe not even WordPress. Maybe you want to go with one of these hosted uh, blogging platforms like Medium. I don't know. But I think the use case is what, what matters the most. Like, what are your goals? What are your priorities? Maybe you have a team full of Drupal developers and none of them, they all hate JavaScript. Well, I mean, a decouple probably doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> right. But the nice thing about what's happening in Drupal and WordPress is that even if you're not doing decoupled, you still get all that API goodness built in. So you could render your HTML with Drupal, let, let it do that job and also feed out all that content to, you know, Twitter or, uh, you know, a, a sister site that consumes your content. So 
that's one of the side benefits of all this API driven stuff is now the tools built into these systems are getting better and you know more powerful. Yeah, you kind of expanded my mindset a bit there when you talked about interfacing with other third parties or applications that you have that aren't just websites with your content management system. So let's maybe explore that a little bit more. I understand when you post a Twitter, you post a Facebook, they'll very often do a screen scrape of an HTML page. How does that work differently when you're having them interface with your decoupled content management system? Yeah, how that happens is they they look at the, so like Twitter, for example, they look at the meta tags in your HTML. And one of the beautiful things about uh, the internet is that it's so anarchic and that can be good and bad. And one of the bad things is that there's so many uh, varying standards. So every social provider has their own special way that they like to have the meta tag set. So to, to make it work with decoupled, uh, because there are modules in the Drupal world that just kind of set that stuff up for you. You just have to handle that in your front end. So you have to set up your meta tags to display like a short snippet and maybe, you know, uh, a trimmed version of your main profile uh, pick or whatever that you're using. So it's, it's totally a solvable problem. And, and I think like Gatsby has like a built-in tool that, that you can use for that stuff. Interesting. So the standard that Twitter and Facebook are using to retrieve the data is basically what they're already doing. But the decoupled approach is making it easier for you to present the appropriate meta tags for those third party systems when they scrape the HTML page. Yeah, this isn't really much of a difference with decoupled or coupled. Okay. Um, it, I mean, most Drupal sites, if they're set up cr properly, there's a module that a coworker of mine maintains called meta tag and for Drupal at least. And I, it's used on tons and tons of sites and it basically does this for you. So it pre presents it like a form so we can get defaults or you can override it. So one of the disadvantages of decoupled a lot of times is especially because it's still young, it's still new, some of these solutions aren't as well tested and, and maybe some of them don't exist where they do exist like in the Drupal and WordPress world. Uh, so, but that's another opportunity for folks to get their feet into uh, open source development. So it's, uh, it's kind of a you know, mixed, mixed bag there. Open invitation to listeners to contribute. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned apps. Maybe speak to that a little bit. If I've got an iOS app or an Android application and I want those to benefit from having a, a headless or decoupled content management system, how could that work to help me? Well, I mean, I think developers would rather focus on their core product instead of the supporting cast of services. So the b benefit is that once you build this content API, you might be doing it originally just to feed your website, but you've already, now you've got this content API. So if I want to request the most recent 10 articles, I can just make an HTTP request and get that information. And now the app developer team, they don't have to go write an API or anything. They can just use the, uh, the API that's already there for them for content. And that's, that's one of the big, big pluses that people like with decoupled is you develop a content API that, and you don't have to redo that every time you develop a new app. I imagine you could still implement that with REST, but what are the pros and cons of either approach? And are there maybe some other approaches that somebody could have besides those two? There, there are pros and cons with REST and GraphQL. I'm not an expert in this, this subject, but I've definitely worked with both quite a bit. And so REST is definitely the older kid on the block. Been around, most people understand it. So that's a, that's a big advantage. Uh, it's also just baked in with Drupal core, uh, with WordPress as well. Most most developers know how to work with, with REST. It, but the di big difference between the two is that REST, the backend developer is defining the the content model 100%. And the front end, or cons it doesn't have to be front end, but I mean the consumer of the API, really their, their options are limited. They can request a resource and then they get back whatever that resource has. GraphQL is a different structure where your your queries that you actually send a post with a query and then the GraphQL server will respond with just the data that you requested. Uh, and so the advantage there is that uh, there's less data crossing the network. The consumer doesn't have to filter out the content they do want or they don't want, which can be embarrassing in some situations. Like if you get in a situation where you're requesting a bunch of data and some of that data you never wanna show in your app, but somebody made a bug or made a mistake and now you're showing, you know, 
like somebody's uh, phone number where you shouldn't. And GraphQL, if that's not in your query, you'll, you won't get the phone number back. Whereas with REST, you're kind of at the mercy of the backend team that wrote the API. And somebody could crack open their Chrome tools, look at the console and see that in transit versus in GraphQL, if it's not part of the query, it will never come back across the wire at all. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yes, definitely. One of the disadvantages of GraphQL is that because you have that flexibility, um, you have to really think about your GraphQL API differently because you can get in situations where a front-end developer or a client developer that's developing a client that consumes content could write a query that, you know, could make, bring bring the server to its knees. You can write really complex things. So there's a balancing act there. You're, I mean, I think you're shifting more power over to the consumer versus the power being in the back end. So a lot of us that have lived in the back end developing, it's a little uncomfortable at first, but I do think the benefit for us that write APIs from time to time is that this means less revisions on the API because the flexibility is there. We don't have to have version 15 of our REST API and maintain all right. 15 versions of the API. Right. So it, it's help, it helps out a lot there. And, and the front end devs really love, love it um, because of the power it gives them. So Okay. So don't expose your GraphQL API endpoints to the public, I think is a word of caution there. Yes, you want to be careful with, the, I mean, with any API, yeah, you, you need to handle, handle like I said, cores. You want to use JSON web tokens. I mean, there's other approaches and things, but um, yeah, you definitely want to make sure, be careful, yeah. Conversation possibly for another day. Yes, you definitely want to think about it and uh, do some research. Okay. So where should people get started? It sounds like it's a lot to swallow. It's people have been drinking from a fire hose for the, about the last hour, but if people want to get started, where should they go if they want to learn more about decoupled content management systems? I've been looking at this uh, website. It's, I think it's pretty interesting. If, if you're from, coming from more of a backend kind of perspective called uh, headlesscms.org. And it, I don't know if it's geared towards backend folks, probably not, but it gives you a nice list of uh, different CMSs that are, headless or decoupled. Um, and there's everything on there from Jekyll to or Jekyll admin, which I've never heard of, uh, to the Drupal one I mentioned before, Contenta. Uh, there's a Node.js one called Strappy. Uh, there's Ghost. And then there's there's some of the uh, closed source kind of startup-y ones like uh, Sanity and Contentful. I think probably the easiest one to get started with is something like Sanity or Contentful because you can just go spin up a site for free and get an API and just start playing with things. Uh, if you want to get into more flexibility and you know either Node or PHP, you could get one of these open source ones and install it and just start messing around with it. It's pretty fun just to kind of play with this stuff. Like you said, spin it up on a weekend because yeah. that's what developers like to do. Yeah, and I, I, I have to say like the, the Contenta project's really good for Drupal, you know, but if you're not a PHP person or, you know, comfortable with Drupal, that might not be the best place to start. Okay. Is there anything else that we might have missed on the topic that you'd want to mention in the time we have left? I don't think so. We covered a whole lot of uh, space there uh, along this technology spectrum. So, yeah. Yeah, we definitely did, didn't did go deep dive, but a few times we, we dove down a little bit. But there's a lot of breadth here I think that people could start digging deeper into. Yeah. So how can people find out more about what you're up to? Uh, you can check out. Uh, I'm on Twitter, although I'm not as active as I used to be there. Uh, I'm Kepford on Twitter. I blog occasionally over at the mediacurrent.com website and I co-host a podcast over there called Open Waters and we talk to uh, folks in the industry. And then I have a uh, weekly Drupal newsletter that I've been doing for a really long time called theweeklydrop.com. And so if you're interested in Drupal and just keeping up with that stuff, uh, definitely recommend that. Yeah, there's one other thing. I'm working on a new project uh, for developers called uh, forthedev.com. It's just a, basically a place where you can get developer swag, uh, t-shirts and stuff like that, stickers. So that should be a launch in soon. So if you want to be on the uh, email list, just go on over there and sign up. Sounds great. Well, Bob, thank you very much for this discussion about decoupled content management systems. It's been a pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for having me. All right. This is Jeff Doolittle for Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com.
You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SC Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening. <laughs>